Governors in their final tenure might be facing the tricky question of who succeeds them. And the United States Mission launches a fund for cultural preservation in Nigeria. We'll be having the Public Affairs Officer with the Consulate in Lagos joining us later on the show. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anako. As the 2023 general elections draw near, a number of states are also gearing up to elect their next governors. In 2022, the people of Ekiti State will be going to the polls to select their next governor. Other states who will select new governors are Akwaibom, Cross River, Eboing, Inugu, Kaduna State, Kanu, Katsina, Rivers and Taraba States. Now, in the just recently concluded Anambra state election, the preferred candidate of Governor William Biano not only won the APCA ticket, but also went on to win the election. Is it now safe to say that the governors of these states, which would be going to the polls, would also want to exercise power over who the next leader would be? Well, joining us to discuss this and answer the question is Achike Chude and Biodo Show Me Boss political analyst. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Great. I'm going to start with you, Shomi. Um, it's interesting that um, uh, Ekiti State is where everybody's looking at. Um, and I think you and I uh, had a conversation recently about, you know, the politics around, um, you know, the next elections. But we also see something very interesting happening in Ekiti, not just the men throwing their hats into the ring, but we're seeing a lot more women um, who are also um, putting their best foot forward uh, to run for governorship. Um, but um, in Ekiti State, we have Governor Fayemi, who is of the APC. Uh, and then we, we know that in, in, in Ekiti, we have the APC and the PDP fighting tooth and nail to make sure that they emerge uh, as the, you know, um, the, the party for 2022. But let's start by uh, looking at the election electoral process. We see that sometimes... Um, uh, the governors always want the person they think can take over from them and do a better job. Sometimes maybe for the wrong reasons, sometimes for the right reasons, but the governors always want to exercise that power. But we also see uh, sometimes the hand of ESO in states where you have godfathers who decide, um, you know, who the next person would be. But in a kitty state, uh, we have seen Fayemi hold a, a, a national appointment before he came back to become governor. Um, with all the people who have put their foot forward to run for governorship, do you think it's going to be an easy task to pick somebody to succeed him? Um, yes. Um, when you look at Ekiti, Ekiti is one single ethnic state. Um, you don't have to... Um, different ethnics uh, in Ekiti. They are all Ekiti people and that's all. And therefore, we are likely going to have um, what I would call a robust challenge, you know, without the void of um, ethnic politics, you know, in the selection of who will be the next gubernatorial candidate for the state. Now, when you go into the issues, there are made three major issues why people um, existing governors want to midwife the new <clears throat> governor. And the first one is the issue of um, continuity of programs uh, in office. We live in a country where there are a lot of abandoned programs. So many governors genuinely um, you know, think that they should be in a position to ensure that their vision of development um, should continue when they are out of office. That is one part. The second fact also is you may have governors who are troubled by um, the way they govern the state, or maybe due to malfeasance or face severe allegations, and also interested in showing that um, they can get one of their cronies you know, to who will be more supportive to be in power. Then you have a third factor, which is the issue of capitalism. Um, when it comes to government, Godfatherism, every governor wants to control the politics of the state. They're used to it when they're in office, being the leader of the party. And when they're out of party, they still want to be in a position to dictate who gets what. 
within the state. So those are the three major factors. Now, back to APT state, it's not a straightforward issue when it comes to that, because there are a, lot, a number of other factors uh, that could come to play. AKT has a, a good sense of um, uh, social justice in the sense that they tend to look at the performance and how it has impacted on the well-being of the people and of the state. That is one uh, major issue for APT people. The second issue is also, uh, th there's also the issue of the stomach infrastructure, which is quite very important. Because when you look at the city state, it's quite a very, very poor state uh, with virtually no industries, apart from one brick industry, which I know of. I don't know of any other industry. Uh, said we want to talk of the of spring water, which is, um, when you talk about industries, you don't really need the part of those. You know? So it's not it's a civil society. It is also very peculiar in, in the sense that it is the only state in Nigeria where majority of the people voting are actually 45 upward. Those are the majority. Unlike in many states where you have the minority of uh, the voters being the young uh, people. The simple reason is because you don't have the industries, there are no jobs or employment apart from civil service. So what you then add is all the youths graduating tend to migrate to other cities in search of uh, greener pastures. So, mm -hmm. consequently, AKT uh, voters tend to be civil servants, teachers, and um, older people. So, that is the uniqueness of AKT state itself. So, on um, succeeding itself, if you look at the pattern, um, Fawashi was in power, he was kicked out of power due to alleged um, corruption, um, only to be replaced you know, by the, the, the election of God, Governor Kao Defiemi. Fahemi was in power, he was considered as not being too distant you know, from um, the grassroots. Again, he was um, kicked out. We had a short brief of Kuni Chagoni in power. Fahemi came back, he was uh, Minister of Mines and Power, then he came back. Minister of Mines, then he came back um, to become the government. So you have Chagoni now angling to say that, look, there's a tradition, there's a principle mm -hmm. of AKT people wanting people to complete. Um, the their time. In the case of Uni, he never completed any time because he was kicked out by the courts. So in this situation, he tends to enjoy a lot of sympathy. Um, I know that he's not in the same APC with the uh, family. I mean, he actually led uh, to go to PDP um, to slug it out with the former deputy government, the other which originally um, for the ticket of the party. Mm. But what be that as it may, my guess feeling is that we are likely going to see Shagunia margin for PDP um, uh, because there are also other even in the midst of all the women that the PDP. I mean, because I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, about eight women have you know thrown their hats into the ring, meaning that we have more women than usual running for the post of a governor. So amidst all of these women, you're telling me that um, one person is going to emerge, and that might be a man and not a woman. Yes, it's, it's, it's due to the way AKT people think. You know, I know the place very well. I have been with the people um, sufficiently to know that um, apart from being, being, a, uh, being chauvinistic, you know, there's a male chauvinistic tendency, just like in other parts of Europe. It's not just about AKT state. We have the same situation in other parts of the country. But you have a situation where uh, the recurring decima uh, in AKT, if you have to go by the two uh, precedents, is um, uh, once the governor has been elected and kicked out, um, they tend to have some sympathy, get the person to come back. In the case of Oni, Oni did well. Uh, in the short time he was in office, he was thrown out by the courts. You know, at least that's the view of the people. He enjoys a lot of sympathy, you know, across the board. He has been, he's been in APC, he has been in uh, PDP. So he has some measure of support across the two political parties, unlike the female candidate. Know that he's not a pushover, and he's quite very popular within the state. He's from Ifaki. You know, so he's quite very, very popular from a, okay. a substantial voting population area. So when you look at the, the, the situation, um, it, it is likely, in my view, uh, not likely going to... Go for, Go for a female this time. But they might okay. choose a female as a deputy governor. But they are still likely going to uh, go for a male. Well, all that, that, remains, that, that remains to be seen. But let me quickly go to uh, Achike. Achike, um, 
who picks the preferred candidate? Because this has been a, a conversation that we've had over and over again. Um, it's one thing to say you want a good candidate to be um, flying the flag of your party, but then who does the picking? Because uh, that we see this issue of governors always wanting a predecessor to be that person that's either anointed or picked up, or you know, picked by a godfather of sorts, depending on the state. But most times we see governors bringing their own cronies, just like um, uh, Mr. Shomi has said. But where do we come in here to make sure that whoever comes or whoever the party throws up at the end of the day can carry on the legacies of um, the governor that just left? I'll give you an instance. For example, you have a cross river state which has had a Donald Duke, amazing governor. And you also had the next uh, person who was a former, um, a former senator. Uh, he was a former minister for power. He was a former minister for education, then became governor. But then you now have a Ben Ayade who's taken the state back 10 years. Um, this all obviously calls for concern. And it's not just that he's now moved to the opposition. Um, how does this play into picking a predecessor? Because that seems to be, uh, it's going to be a war between the APC and the PDP come 2023. Well, I think our democratic uh, culture, or our democracy has not gotten to a level where you can say that, uh, from, uh, that at every level of um, selection or election of um, political leaders, uh, that is from ward level to local government level, depending on uh, the kind of election they are running, that uh, you would always, you know, uh, have very best of um, of uh, candidates. Uh, it's not it's not going to happen at least for now, uh, because the process of choosing uh, candidates to run elections, even at the councillorship election or local government election, not to talk of even the higher offices, state offices or uh, federal, you know, uh, level. Uh, is such that um, it is only people uh, that have uh, very serious connections with the powers that be within the political parties, the structure of those political parties, that can actually be in a position uh, to choose the person they want. And so once such people are picked, uh, the next thing is to present them uh, to, the, uh, to, to the members of uh, the party and to the public for election. And uh, the people actually really have no choice because we have not gotten to a level where uh, you know, uh, party ideology or the ideology drives uh, the voters uh, to the polling uh, uh, units, uh, drives them to into making or casting their, their ballots uh, on the basis of the things that they believe. So people vote for, you know, candidates uh, just because the candidates represent political parties and they represent other interests, not because they represent any strong ideological compass. And so that is the issue. And then you know, because the, the reality is that uh, most of these political parties actually belong, and we are, even if I may be an exaggeration, of course, if I use the word, but to a very large extent, at least on the basis of the influence that certain people have within these political parties, you could say to a very large extent that the certain people have larger than life, you know, attitude, um, uh, you know, image within those political parties. They determine what happens in the political parties. We've had this conversation, you know, Mary Ann, you know, with, with you on this, you know, particular program. So ultimately, at the end of the day, the people are actually disempowered. I, uh, you know, if you all all right, to, you know, uh, through the voting, uh, you know, the the selection process of candidates. So what you see ultimately at the end of the day is that people must go out uh, to uh, uh, to vote. Uh, candidates and in most but cases, isn't that they a choice between a lesser candidates. evil? Isn't that a choice? Because I think that's that's what it boils down to. It's that's become that becomes a choice between uh, a bigger devil and a lesser devil, like what happened to us in 20, 2015. I'm asking this question because in Anambra, it seemed that maybe except one person, the candidates that were presented seemed better, and and th there were options, there were good options, but then of course the best man in quote yeah. won. So why can't we have that in every but other when, state? Why can't we when, have when, that replicated? Yeah, well, let's put it this way. In spite of, in spite of the, the deficits that we have within our, de our democratic process, the reality, if you look at the kind of candidates that emerge nowadays, you will find out that there's an improvement, actually, at least at the level, and I'm not talking about the moral imperatives of each of these people. I'm not talking about their ethical orientation at least in terms of the presentation of this of, of candidates, in terms of the level of education you know, that some of them have, 
uh, you find out that there is an, actually an improvement, uh, you know, in uh, the qualification of some of these people for public office. So we saw that in Anambra State, and we saw the debates, the governorship debates. We saw how articulate most of the people that participated were. Uh, you know, so at that level, yes, we are beginning to have an upgrade in terms of the qualification of these people for public office. But at the moral level, and that is actually where the bane of, you know, of our politics is, because the people who ultimately emerge as political leaders are people who do not even act in conformity with the hopes and aspirations of the people, people who get there for the purpose of personal aggrandizement. And so you see the corruption that is going on. You see the perversion of, of, of public office, you, you know, and the disobedience or the respect even for the rule of law, even in their states and, not, and, and also at the federal level. But in spite of that, perhaps people would say, maybe the excuse we can provide is the fact that we have about 60 years of, 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 uh, of um, you know, uh, of independence. And out of the 50 years, we have perhaps about 30 something years of, you know, democracy or democratic practice. While some other countries that were imitating have had about 200, 250 years, perhaps to some extent, we can provide some excuses for us that it is still, you know, a process in the works, but, and that but does we that, might but the, eventually but get does there. Does that excuse hold water? Because do we really necessarily have to wait two hundred years to have a strong democracy? I mean, if we're copying, can't we copy well? Just saying. Sorry, I didn't hear you. I'm saying I do not necessarily think that that excuse holds water. If we're having to wait, like the U.S. to uh, attain 200 years of democracy, then uh, it means that we're not necessarily no, no, copying you well. See, you see, we have to wait till yeah, then. No, you see, yeah, you see, we already have a template. That's why that argument might not hold for too long. Because for some of the countries that we're talking about, there was a process. Society is evolutionary. And so there was a process that lasted hundreds of years before they got to where they are. You understand? Of course, we all know where we, we our, our that process was abridged as a result of colonialism and the rest. And so they give us a template that we are operating. We have not, you know, it, as a result of, 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 of our evolution as a country, mm -hmm. we have not gotten to where we should, we should get to and at the time that we should get there. This has already been given to us. So we have a template that we're already working with. So if we consider that from that, I mean, from that perspective, we can say, that there is no way we can be talking about waiting for another 200 or 250 years. Okay. We have everything that it takes. We have, we have the, the advantage of education and, and the fact that we have so many other tools in the modern world that we use to at least have an idea of where to get to and all of that. But the issue, again, like I keep on saying, is the moral imperative. We seem to be lacking it, okay. you know, over the years. And that's why we are where we are today. Okay, let me come back to you, uh, Biadu. Um, Let's talk about the issue of governors now making the Senate, uh, you know, a retirement home of sorts, for the want of a better, you know, way to uh, explain it. Um, we've seen that happen um, uh, over the years now. We've seen governors retire from governorship and become senators. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to understand, is there a written rule somewhere? Who came up with the idea that governors can just you know, when they end their tenure, just go to the Senate, because we see a lot of governors angling for that. Um, is it something that somebody came up with, or it was just a convenient way to run away from something? Well, I think this is a product of um, our first experience when President Obasanjo was in power, um, when the EFCC was set up, and so many of the governors were concerned, you know, about what the future holds in store for them um, when Mumu Rubadu was in charge of this. Of course, we had all the argument, oh, it's one-sided, it's not one-sided, it's one, uh, it's a partisan investigation of the other. So there were allegations. But the fact of the matter is, many of the then governments were so petrified about life after um, being governors for eight years and decided that, look, it might be more convenient you know, to uh, go to Senate where you can still hold some major influence. Uh, and we've seen those influence being deployed um, at different points in time you know, to leverage you know, on uh, alleged crimes committed or the way they are under treated or granted bail by the state. So we've seen all this in action because at the end of the day, 
if they're in Senate, they have oversight functions, you know, over, and uh, also power to make laws over those agencies you know, that would um, uh, investigate or prosecute them. So I think that is a major factor in why many of the governors are hanging to go to So you're saying that the governors are afraid or they're evading um, investigation as to corruption or monies that are missing in the coffers. You're saying that this is the best way to run, um, run away from, you know, the EFCC? No, 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 no. I'm saying that it is, for them, the way they build it is, um, and they're still doing it, is when you are in the Senate, you enjoy a measure of protection, being a senator of the Federal Republic. And therefore, um, you are in a position to carry out oversight function, you know, to leverage on your membership of the Senate, you know, on uh, those agencies, who in any case should be having oversight functions over, who are supposed to prosecute you. That is just one angle to it. There's the other angle, which is the angle of um, 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 Godfatherism. Um, many of them think when a new government is in there, uh, they are likely not going to dance to their whims and caprices. And therefore, going into the Senate affords them the opportunity to hold on to a tour of the constituency you know, in the state and um, still make themselves politically relevant, politically relevant you know, within that state. And they're in a position to cause trouble and for the government, we have seen that quite copious examples of where you have senators, you know, not even, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, not parleying with the government. And they're so powerful that the governors at times are worried about um, whether they will be able to get a second time ticket or not. So these are the major factors which are, uh, you can say are responsible for governors wanting, you know, to go to the Senate as... Um, a, a, a political base, you know, after the end of this as they go. Um, it's not just about uh, the fact that they want to have a level, but they still want to be politically relevant. You can look at some of those former governors who were, never went to Senate, particularly in the Southwest. Many of them are today are no longer relevant in the politics of their different states. So I think these are the issues um, um, which are motivating the okay. wanting to go to the Senate. Okay, let, back to you, um, Achike. You you obviously um, work with civil societies, and um, I always wonder what the conversations should be uh, in terms of the fact that when the average Nigerian is listening to these kinds of conversations, they hear and understand what the inner workings of political parties are. What's stopping the average Nigerian from joining political parties and being part of these decisions that are made at whatever level, no matter w how low the levels are? Number two, um, we're also seeing that... Um, States who were predominantly, let's say, PDP uh, and have now had their governors cross over to the opposition are having a lot of infighting as we speak. Um, the likes of, um, um, we have uh, the Cross River State government, we have Zamfara State, we also still know that the deputy governor of Zamfara is still with the PDP. Um, we also have uh, Governor Mahi of Eboy who also, you know, cross capited And we're seeing a lot of infighting within these parties. What's 2023 going to look like already? Um, Party conventions are, are still yet to be convened for some people, uh, for some political parties. We know that Congresses have had, they've had parallel Congresses in certain states because of, you know, this infighting. For Cross River State, it was a big drama where the state PDP secretariat was converted overnight to an APC uh, secretariat. So we have issues like that. Um, what does 2023 look like for those states, especially the three uh, states that we have, I have mentioned? Yeah, well, um, uh, obviously, uh, we we all know that um, uh, what we are just seeing now is a tip of the iceberg. Uh, the uh, political elites in, in, in the country, unfortunately, is not a very responsible elite. Uh, they are not motivated by the desire to serve the public. Uh, it is all about personal aggrandizement to a very large extent. So what we see in terms of uh, you know provision or, or you know of certain uh, 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 public essentials, if I use the expression, is just mere tokenism. At least, if you look at the quantum of what is available uh, to some of these uh, politicians or governors, you realize that they are absolutely pulling, you know, punching below their weight, and and that's why we have seen all kinds of uh, crises. And like I said, 
These are political parties that are not governed by any strong ideological compass. Uh, it, you know, so, and, and, and when you have that kind of a situation, anything goes, anything can be justified. And, 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 and so a governance is done on the basis of the whims and caprices of you know, a particular governor, not even on the basis of uh, you know, the party philosophy, because you don't even have any serious enduring party philosophy. Uh, you know, because that should be what should be motivating most of these governors. And if we look at what has happened in the country, uh, in this, especially in the Second Republic, we had a situation where political parties were exceedingly very strong, and where the state chairman, either the, the state chairman of the parties or the national chairman of the parties, were very, very strong. That today, you, you talk about a governor being the leader of the party in the state or the president being the leader of the party at the national level. But during the Second Republic, where we had the Adesai Akin lawyers and the rest, you found out that, uh, you know, some of the governors and and the, and the president, Shehu Shagari, you know, were beholding on the chairman, on, on, on the party chairman, because they were power, powerful. They determined the direction that the political party was going to go. Uh, you know, but that has changed. And so some of the crises, or most of the crises that you are seeing, is simply because you have governors that have taken upon themselves, uh, you know, the, the toga of absolute wisdom and knowledge over what happens within their domain, uh, you know. And when you have that kind of situation, where you do not allow polarity, you know, or cross, cross fertilization of ideas between the members of the party, where it must be one person that would have a say, the tendency is for you know over time to sow seeds of rebellion. And this is what you're announcing. That's what is responsible for fun of some of the disparities. So for okay. 2023, you know, it is not unless they can get their ass acts together. Of course, we have seen the bickering. We have seen, uh, especially at the level of uh, the APC as a political party, we have seen even their inability to even have a proper Congress. And we saw what happened in Lagos State, and not just the APC, even the PDP too. So that does not pretend well for you know, 2023, simply because the people who should be driving the politics of 2023 are, are themselves locked in all kinds of, you know, crisis. Okay. And if they don't resolve this crisis, you are going to see some of these things play out before 2023. Well, I'm wondering why the average Nigerian cannot be part of the political process and we keep calling it a debt again. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Be able to show me, Achike Chude, thank you very much for being part of this conversation. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. All right. My pleasure. Thank you for staying with us. Coming up on Plus Politics, the United States mission in Nigeria tells us how it hopes to ensure cultural preservation in the country. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have a conversation.